Good morning, Doug. What's up? Just uh, another Friday. These things come fast. Yeah, and we had sunshine. I don't keep track of the days of sunshine that we have, like we do our stock charts, but uh, I don't think we had many sunny days in January, and so I was loving it yesterday and this morning. Well, I added a nice disclaimer there. Careful when you're walking your dog. I was walking mine today and Amazon Basics uh, provided for me, but they had the whole bag was full of disclaimers there. And so be careful out there. So do you order those? Connie does. That's impressive. Yeah, Connie. Um, the, the world is different. Like the, the, you got a bit of a disclaimer on a plastic bag. I was having breakfast with my daughter Kelly today and um, offered my opinion about that to her. And she said I shouldn't say what I was saying on here because um, our culture that needs a disclaimer on a dog bag says something about our culture is really struggle. The struggle bus if you don't know how to operate one of those. So I should look out for a disclaimer on our Kroger sacks. Maybe there's one on there. There may be. I don't. I, I mean, I saw them on beach balls years ago. And um, I'm not sure kind of uh, what that was all about, but uh, um, that happened. So I'm not sure what's going on on the screen here. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Hi. <laughs> that was unusual. <laughs> well, uh, I, I found this cartoon from our friend Ken. I thought I'd share this with our friends this morning. Um, this is kind of an old school cartoon, right? I don't know if you all can read that, but they're standing at some bougie dinner club or something, it looks like here. And all experts say the market is going to turn around. And the expert says, but I said, maybe. So I went to a really great um, not the profit type thing this week where there were some really cool people hanging around there and made some nice connections and uh, met some new friends. And it was the first time in a long time where someone said, oh, you're in the investment business? What do you think about dot, dot, dot? And I haven't experienced that in a long while. Huh. That that traditionally has been a bearish signal when right. that starts happening. Well, I I, ha I had a, a social situation this week where somebody was repeating to me something a financial person told them, and they couldn't repeat it. They couldn't get it right, so I didn't understand exactly what they were saying. But what they said is that Democrats tend to hold stocks when a Democrat runs wins the presidency and Republicans tend to hold stocks when a Republican wins the presidency. And consequently, people tend to do better when their person is in the White House. It's kind of the essence of what I thought I heard him saying. And I said, well, if you watch the stock market over time, it's like a saw blade. And so it makes sense if you just happen to be in there yeah. during your particular political bias, then you'll probably be okay. Not, I mean, there, there's more than two beliefs out there, but they could probably be grouped into one, the markets are efficient and they just kind of work themselves out. Uh, the other would be that markets are inefficient and those inefficiencies are operated with the principles of uh, just stupidity, <laughs> greed and uh, unclear thinking. And so there could be opportunity. And I tend to lean on that side of the camp. I, he, there's, there's a lot of stupidity. Yes. There. Yeah. yeah. Well, Including me at times. I throw myself into that camp. And because we start thinking wrong, we start thinking, well, uh, we're biased towards this uh, stack set of data or we're biased towards this experience that we've had in our life. And so the more and more uh, rules and an operating procedure that you can have, the better you'll be. Yeah, I I told somebody that I, I've spent so much time studying the market that when people start asking me those kind of questions, I'm just trying to be kind and get the conversation kind of closure quickly because a lot of times we're just not on the same page. It's almost like we're speaking foreign languages. And, and so like to actually give my answer might take an hour. So I try to bring it to closure. But yeah, there's all kinds of thoughts and 
And, um, you know, luck is part of it. Some people have just been lucky and they, they happen to get the right stock or they work for the right company for the right time and, and they're lucky, but that they sometimes confuse that. But I, I want to throw out an idea to you today, Doug, is, I was thinking that, that like in sports, whether it's tennis or a variety of different sports, tennis is one that comes to mind that you, you can be, probably golf is the same way. You can be a really good tennis player or golfer by just not screwing up. By just playing like the fairway or right, right. You, you just don't use your woods. Just yeah. use your irons and get it in the middle of the fairway or tennis. Just get it back over the net. That's all you got to do is get it back over yeah. the net. You're going to win more often than you're not. So not trying to be slick, right. either golfing or in tennis. But but the same is with your finances. And so I, I threw out the idea to you, the opposite side of that. Like how could you screw up your finances okay. the best that you could? Yeah if you given the chance so so if i want to just screw up my finances do these things which is kind of just teaching through the opposite and yeah so um so that was what i threw out an idea to talk to you about i didn't know if yeah. any, any ideas came to mind for you i had you know a handful that yeah i, I think uh, a few uh one philosophically and a couple you know action items came to mind for me but what about you yeah the the one that like the one that you could really screw up your finances is to not take love seriously. Okay. Yeah. We yeah. don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Like casual love, <laughs> like um, to get, get married right away without stopping and thinking about it. Cause you put half of all your future wealth at risk by simply uh, not taking that as a serious thing. Yeah. And, and so Nobody talks about that as yeah. a financial risk, but it tends to be a pretty substantial one that's out there. And and so like how might one the compounding effect? Oh yeah. And 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 so the how might one think about that if they're a young person is they probably need to ask better questions while they're dating. Like they might not think that's a financial mm -hmm. situation, but you know, um, what is it we agree on and what is it we don't agree on and are these things things that we can last long term. Yeah, and those wouldn't have to be etched in stone. I mean, you, no. can, you can just keep communicating along the way. Yeah, I was having a conversation with Kelly at breakfast this morning. We were talking about how your thoughts evolve over time. But generally, you're going to you're gonna stay in some bumpers like in the bowling alley. But uh, I would encourage young people to just ask really good questions to, to not just buy in at the surface yeah. level because there's, there's a lot to... When I, when I told my kids when they were, you know, thinking about this is how many friendships do you have that you've had for a decade? And most of them don't have any, really. And so if you're planning on it, you know, like a lot of our clients who've been married 50 years, you probably have to have a commitment beyond the surface level to help you look at the future. So, so choosing wisely is probably one of the most um, important financial decisions you can have, not only that it doesn't split things in half, but to have a cheerleader yeah. for both sides of the coin there to cheer you on to be your best self. So I think Connie has always seen the best Keith, not not the current Keith, but the future That's Keith, good. because uh, the 30 year old version of Keith that she got wasn't all that in a bag of chips. <laughs> so that, that was it. That's a that's a financial thing. Nobody really ever talks. I don't hear. I don't really see anybody yeah, talking about that in financial that circles. Goes in line with you know what I was thinking about, and, and, and it's just really thinking through your finances. Not many, not many people think through them with a healthy mindset, and and one of the traps that I see is is this idea, and maybe it sounds first person singular to you. It's I don't I don't have enough. I don't have enough to get started, or uh, what I've heard for people who are retired is. Um, I, I don't have as much as as your the rest of your clients. Right. It, right. So just this comparison of I don't have enough or um, I wish I had more, uh, that could really sandbag you. And, and, and the action step is to start and, and to start accumulating or to start saving or to say, hey, well, how much is enough? And, yeah. and if you can answer that question, how much is enough, then you can make some decisions on how you value your time, how you value your freedom. But I think just unhealthy thinking is a, uh, is a 
it's, it's just a major problem when it comes to personal finances. I, I in that same vein, the, the the second one I wrote down is comparison. I think uh, comparison is the thief of joy, and 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 so you know sometimes you hear it called keeping up with the Joneses, and okay, yeah. and yeah. and kind of comparing my car to your car or my house to your house, and and the fact of the matter is generally those two assets. What more often than not they say is how much debt you have, not um, necessarily what uh, what kind of wealth that you have, and so you can't really find joy in comparison. I don't think. Yeah, I I think another problem is is just not knowing what you have and not knowing what it is. Uh, that could lead to improper titling of an asset. Um, a beneficiary can get left out. Yeah. A beneficiary could be included that you don't want them to be included on. And, and so just thinking through, hey, what what do I own? And however you want to score that on a piece of paper or with me and Keith, Phil, you know, however you want to score it is fine. But, but you need to know what you own and, and where it's going. And then kind of going back to that marriage thing, be able to communicate that with your spouse. And if you don't have a spouse, just being able to communicate those that to those you love. Boy, that's, um, I think nothing worse could be than, than the assets land to the wrong beneficiary, you know, yeah. and you can, they can't do that generally once that's happened. And, and you can do so much today with titling and, and we're not taught that. I mean, everybody at some point in time, you know, you need a will or you need some type of instructions even though you know you need it. Michael Jackson didn't do it. I don't think, I, or who was it? I can't remember. I can't. Oh, Prince. We were, talking, Prince. were we talking about Prince the other day? I mean, there are people, I, who knows what stops? It's probably, a, it's probably poor thinking that stops yeah. people from doing this. Yeah. Uh, realizing that um, there is going to be a finish line, just being honest. Right. And so, right. But, but if you can uh, get real and write down where you want stuff to go, share that with somebody so it is in, in the form of a legal proper title yeah so so probably bad communication about those things is about it where yeah so once a year honey and i will travel somewhere and i'll just pull out our net worth statement it's really the most concise thing yeah. of where we're at and so i have things in in connie's name my name and joint name and then the total and i just walk her through those things and talk through here's what we've done in the last you know 12 months or so and this is where we're at and then that's a good conversation thing. But I think, again, one of those things people don't do is they don't communicate about situations. I think of one of our friends over on the, the West side where her husband didn't tell her anything and she was so angry about that lack of... Just thinking of that too. Yeah. That, and, and so communication um, goes back to that first thing about the importance of choosing right on the marriage side is that if you're not communicating today about your finances, I'd say a good word today is a good... I'm mean, Like whatever it is you're afraid to talk about, just lock, lock the softball out there to talk about it. Trying to think just where I've screwed up in the past. And 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 for me personally, like when when I don't know something, I tend to stall. And so it, it takes time and then you allow time to expand and the compounds and stuff's not happening. And so I've missed out on opportunities. I've either missed out on an opportunity for an investment or an opportunity to be more clear on something. And so if, if there's something you don't know, there's so many good resources to just to say, raise your hand, I don't know, and say, I need some help. And that could be through the office here, that could be through your accountant, uh, that could be calling the the, uh, the uh, courthouse and saying, hey, how is my property titled? Is this in a joint account? Or, you know, just, just knowing more, but taking a step towards knowing I think will help you make better investment decisions too. One of those stallings that I had probably when I still had bangs was like putting a will in place. So not having a will, like we said, but, but particularly with guardians for the children, because, you know, that communication between Connie and I, and who do we want? Do we want your siblings, my siblings? How do you want that to go? It wasn't really an easy decision for us. Right. And so, no decision is a bad decision, particularly if you're talking about your children and, and where they're going to spend their lifetime if you happen to be in an uh, accident of some some manner. Uh, I'd say another uh, another good mistake to make if you want to blow up your finances is, are the three letters GRQ, the idea that you can get rich quick. And, and whatever those strategies, whatever those ways are to try to get rich quick, 
you're probably going to waste your most valuable resource, which is time. Uh, right. And you're going to you, you're going to lose probably some money on those. And those you, ideas. you could very well get one right. Getting rich quick. I mean, you, you might land it, um, but you have to know how did it happen? Did I get lucky? What parameters would I set up for risk if this thing doesn't work out? And so I know some of you are speculative investors. Maybe it's in real estate or another business deal. But just because it was, was rewarded once in your life doesn't mean it's going to be rewarded again. And that's where we go back to how we pick investments is we have safety valves on stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I, I think even saying that is not that you can't be speculative. But like the, the gambler book I mentioned a few weeks ago, that that fellow, he, he would as probably one of the best gamblers of all time he would only risk one to three percent on any bet and my guess is with like uh some of the draft kings kind of things that people are putting 50 to 100 percent of their money they're willing to gamble in a particular bet and and that kind of get rich quick was a way to go back to zero and get the uh, what was it in monopoly go back to start do not pass go you you, you cycle around and you give up one of your most valuable assets as time and so not only getting lucky and hitting something is is part of you know get rich quick, but you also have that time factor, which is a huge deal. Time can work in your favor if you maybe GRS get rich slow. I think another thing to pay attention to, and and, and I don't monitor this religiously, but I do look for money leaks, and uh, we have a little leak in one of our uh, bathroom sinks right now. Got plenty of water supply. You know, the city of Carmel, we got water pumping in my, I, I got un unlimited water supply. However, I have a leak going on. Yes. And that leak could add to a higher water bill. It could add to a bigger problem down the road. And so just even, you know, take a look at your credit card, see where your money's going. Uh, take a look at your bank statement, see where it's going. And my, my guess is you might have a leak or two that you could just take care of like that. And it, Going back to great communication, it would be able to be a great conversation to say, hey, I noticed we have bought this uh, movie on Amazon that we never ordered. Um, let's start paying attention to our, our credit card to make sure that there are any leaks. That's a simple one. I think I think that idea might be one of the most major changes in culture during my adult life, like with with regards to finances, is that. That. I think coming into life and as an adult, like there weren't, there wasn't enough cash flow for leaks and culture wasn't trying to put leaks in your That's right. situation, but everybody is trying to get $2 here, $5 here. And so they're coming, the system is coming at you aggressively. Just, they always want $2 a month, $5 a month. And, and it's easy to say, yes, I'll do that $2 a month. And then the next thing you know, you got 30 of those. Right. Yeah. And so, there's all kinds of things you can really screw up with your finances. I just thought I'd flip it today to throw out there a different way of looking at it. What could I screw up at, rather than what can I do right? And So if I had to boil it down, I, I would say the number one is just beware of thinking right. Yeah. Uh, or being being aware of like just poor thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And and man, that those things can can have a long term effect if you don't stop them. Or what Barney Five say, nip it in the bud. I, I was thinking that ultimately uh, this morning I was listening to this and, and like if you wanted your finances to to go well and like to get a check mark at the end, I, this song um, uh, really when I was thinking about it, whatever your, your quantity of life is, this song kind of says it, it says, you know, I like my chicken fried cold beer on a Friday night, a pair of jeans that fit just right in the radio up. And then it said sweet tea, pecan pie, and homemade wine uh, where the pizzas grow. Sounds like you're moving to Kentucky. No, this is Georgia. No it's the Georgia Pines. So, uh, <laughs> but then he says, uh, uh, well, I've done, seen the sunrise. I've seen love in the woman's eyes, the touch of a precious child, mother's love. Funny how the little things in life that mean the most. Uh, and he said, I thank God for my life. And I think sometimes 
Yeah. When you get when you do those things that are wrong, you're focusing on the wrong things and you get sucked into blowing up things. Or you think really if I just do this, this, and this, and then I'll get that. Right. Instead of living for it right now. Right. And a lot of those things that are in that song, a little shout out to Zach Brown, but a lot of those things don't cost anything, right? Like right. The, the the ability to to have your best life isn't something that's gonna happen down the road. Well, that's a random idea about the market, not the markets, about your finances, but I think those ideas are probably as critical as a lot of the uh, nuts and bolts that you go see the accountant for. Doug, tell me about the markets. What do we need to know about the markets today? I threw up a um, kind of a benchmark here. I don't know if this was on your mind today, but I think we had talked about the, the, the VIX for those of you that are first time listeners today. The VIX is just a measure of the volatility that's in the market right now. And we had been really low. And then we saw some spikes here in the last couple of weeks where it's picked up a little bit. And even so, it's still if it, if it, anything below 20 has generally been a good market for investors. And we're still down below 15. We're in earnings season right now. Uh, you, if you're watching this, you're probably interested in the stock market, and you've probably heard that there are several companies that have come out with earnings this week, and I really enjoy earnings season. I look forward to it. I probably look forward to it because of the book we read and the friend we made in David Malik. And, and David Malik loved to talk about earnings. My Our friend Ron loves to talk about earnings, and um, with earnings, uh, they're just the results of how well a company is doing or not doing. And there's a whole industry that is paid very well to try and guess earnings. And, and these forecasters, uh, what they do is they analyze uh, balance sheets, they look at order flows, and they really get into the weeds of a company and try and decide what type of earnings will company A announce. And they try and get ahead of it and say, oh, it's going to be great or it's going to be bad. And so, and so you have all these analysts and forecasters out there trying to guess what the earnings of a company might be. And then one day they just announce. And whatever that announcement is could be great. It could be in line with the forecaster. It could have uh, been off. But really the most important thing is it's the reaction and so you want to see what's going on with the stock prices that next day. How How is the individual investor, how are they reacting to the news? Because the news, it'll be there for a moment, but the reaction is really the momentum that causes a shift, whether it's positive or negative. And every earnings season, you have someone who you think ah, they're just going to do great and they don't do great. Or maybe their greatness isn't as good as it should have been. And so uh, we've seen some of that this week. And for that reason, we we like to be a little more cautious around earnings time. I love the idea of the earnings conversation because they're like, the, those analysts are probably like weather forecasters. And the weather forecasters have the advantage of technology like they do as well. But you could also talk about the analysts as like sports commentators, right? They're hyping up a game before the game. They all, they're oh, all, man. they're putting their, they're putting their, who they think is going to win the game out right before yeah. the game. And so it's really not much different than the analysts doing their thing. And then once it, the news comes out or once the game is pl being played, it is uh, you see who's kind of the fool and who's not right. the fool. And, and even with that though, the, the corporations have enough leeway in the way they book revenues and sales and the way they push things to the future, pull them to the present. Um, a lot of that's just a dancing with the analysts, like David Malik says. And so, so what happens in the short term is going to create some volatility. And uh, not only that this week, uh, we, we had, we had major earnings announcements, but also in the mix are is, what's going to happen with interest rates. And so not only do we have, corporate stuff being announced, but this week we had some Fed stuff being announced and uh, the stock mar market would just love to see lower rates, lower rates, lower rates all the time, you know, but, but really, I mean, things are going fairly well, okay? If you are a saver, uh, you're, you're being rewarded in the short term, goodness, I mean, 
your interest you're getting on a money market is fantastic. Uh, you're being rewarded for liquidity. But uh, in the stock market itself, yeah, I mean, it's been interesting. We've had a couple uh, what we call distribution days where the price has come down and the volume has gone up on those sellers. We've had, we've had a few of those, and so we're starting to be aware of that. Markets are above their 200-day moving average, and so we're sensitive to that. There's an industry out there right now that's getting some attention because of a bank out in New York that kind of is, is, is going through some tough stuff with corporate real estate. And so there, there's, there's rotations happening. And uh, I think the most important thing right now is, is really just to take a step back. If you take a look at a chart, the general trend has been up. And just to let that digest and, 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 and hopefully you put some money to work. Hopefully your money's working well for you. Uh, if it's not, or, or if you just don't know how it's doing, if you're unaware, give us a call. We'll talk to you about your specific situation. How about this data? This is really crazy. The sensational six stocks, Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet or Google, Amazon, NVIDIA and Meta, formerly Facebook, had a combined market capitalization. That's their stock market value of all their shares combined of $12.02 trillion compared to we've, we've talked about the, the 200 day moving average is is if you took the last 200 trading days of a stock and you average it out and then you put that by it, it gives you the, the 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 kind of a more stabilized valuation of the market or the stocks but if you took the 200 day moving average of those sensational six it's 10.16 so so it's either 12.02 trillion or 10.16 trillion and to put just that span, I'll, I'll show you an example of what that looks like on a on the Nasdaq here. So so here's the Nasdaq right here. That's the value, and then here's the 200-day moving average. And so if we took those sensational six and that gap right there between the moving average and the current valuation uh, is 1.86 trillion dollars. In, in a gap and that equals 65%, that gap equals 65% of the Russell 2000, which is just an insane idea. That's 2000 companies, the gap and just the fluctuation of trading value. The, the Russell or yeah, I'll pull it up. Yeah. Yeah, so the, here's the uh, S&P 400. This is a smaller company, mid cap type companies. And um, some say this is where some opportunity is, but it just really hasn't quite lifted like the NASDAQ has, or really like the Dow has, or the S&P. Go, yeah, go across. That's the, where I That's where I just love to see it get above that, Doug. If that happens, which... Go across that top in September. You're saying right here? Yeah. If it can get it, you know, the, that, that'd be wonderful, because if we take this back on a monthly basis, you can just see where this hasn't, it's just not been doing anything for... All the way back, almost to 2020 and and you know when it does take off it it's historically done a nice job for investors but we have been in a very very flat sp space for the small companies and so to, to think that 65 percent of their value is just measured by the, just the fluctuation of those six what did stocks you say those six were called i never the heard sensational that. six is hey, that's a, I, when you start getting uh marketing involved in, in, yeah. in, in the stock market that's when you know it's crazy this since i've never i've not heard that term i've heard the mac magnificent seven yeah uh, but the sensational six okay yeah and so when something gets a title like that it's no longer a secret so if you think you've got <laughs> the secret because you own well, all those stocks it's not in case we're telling you today, it's not a secret anymore. That that was one of those was was the conversation at, at the uh, at the party I went to, and so it's yeah, it's no secret anymore. <laughs> yeah, you you are you're not smarter than everybody else at this point, but it's so you're you're welcome to hold them. They're just not a secret anymore. Right. So IBM is not a secret anymore. Those of you that have been <laughs> holding it, Doug, I don't have anything else. I uh, uh, it's good to see you guys today, and thanks for hanging out with us. Any any final words? Yeah, have a great weekend and uh, enjoy some positive thinking. All right. I'll see you guys.